Now this is uh, the second part of the presentation uh, of LLVM intermediate representation and here I will be covering control structures. Uh, so, first um, we're going to review the single static atomic property of variables because it has a very important effect on writing control structures in LLVM. Each variable can only be assigned to once. A variable can be assigned to an initial value when it's created, and after that, the value of the variable cannot be changed. So, uh, this uh, we need to keep this paradigm in mind when we are creating uh, our control structures. So, uh, how, how we want to get around that is for virtual registers, they are temporary wasteful R values. We have an infinite number of them, so it does not matter that we cannot reassign them. If you want to reassign a new value to a virtual register, you basically just create a new uh, variable, and then you forget about the old one. Uh, or for, for memory variables, both local and global, we take a slightly different approach. We know that memory variables are just pointers that point in the actual region and memory where the value is stored. They are actually constant pointers. You cannot reassign the pointer to point to something different because then you would lose access to the pointy variable and you would have a memory leak. However, you can change the data at that memory location that the pointer is pointing to. So this is how we would express something in C. The pointer is const, but the data is non-const. Static single assignment property only applies to the actual pointer variable. It does not apply to the point T variable where the actual data is stored. Another uh, thing I would uh, point out is that there is an exception uh, to this rule. Uh, for global variables, uh, they can be declared as constant global. So we just replace the global keyword with constant. It indicates that the contents of the variable will never be modified, which enables us better optimizations, allowing the global data to be placed in the read-only section of an executable, which is called .ro data. So both the pointer is const and the data at that memory location is also const. Now, uh, so what is a variable in general? What is the abstract concept of a variable? A variable means able to change. And the definition of variable is a data item that may take on more than one value during the runtime of a program, which is key for constructing control flow statements. By contrast, constants are data items that cannot change during the runtime of a program. Why are variables necessary in a program versus constants? Variables are necessary for recording changes to a program's state and then acting on such changes. However, the static single assignment property prevents us from changing the variable. In a purely sequential list of instructions, if you are in the same basic block, changes to the state of the variable are like having multiple different copies of the variable. You just use the most recent one, and if you have infinite variables, changing the program state can be expressed as just assigning a different variable and forgetting about the old one. And that is good uh, before we need to branch the controls of the program. So variables are necessary for making changes to the program's behavior in response to changes in the program's state and changing the program state in response to certain behaviors. Since changes to the program's behavior are represented as transitions between different basic blocks in the control flow graph, what we really want to accomplish here is we want to ch save changes to a program's state between different basic blocks. <coughs> so we use variables for passing data between different basic blocks. This means that the variable would be reassigned to at least once in a different basic block, which is prohibited by single static assignment property. 
So overcoming this property allows us to update the states of variables depending on program behaviors, making control flow constructs possible. <coughs> In order to do that, we need to be coding in such a way to one, hold this property of variables for compiler optimization, and two, we want to be able to update the states of variables. From a first glance, it seems like a contradictory desire, but actually, no, it is not. We have two ways of <coughs> doing this. So since memory in data in the memory is modifiable, any variables that needs to change can reside in memory, either in global or stack variables. Or we can have multiple copies of a variable, one for each control flow path. The fee instruction merges multiple definitions or copies of a variable multiple control paths into a single definition depending on which control path was taken, as we will see here shortly. Yeah, so <clears throat> before doing that, we're, we need to see how we can achieve branching among different basic blocks. So we use the conditional uh, branch instruction. So it works Kind of like a question mark colon operator in C++. Based on the value of the Boolean operand, it takes a conditional jump. If the I1 is true, it jumps to the first label. If the I1 is false, it jumps to the second label. And uh, it actually jumps to a basic block, because each basic block starts with the label and ends with the terminator instruction. So that's how we can have control flow. So the condition always has to be I1. That is a very important thing that has to screw people up. You can't have other data types uh, in this condition, uh, I32, for instance. So in C, a non-zero value is considered as true, and you might be able to use integers, for example, as a condition of an if statement. But that is not the case for LLVM intimate representation, which requires explicit type conversions. <coughs> also, another interesting property in, in our uh, branching that I found out is that unlike in x64 assembly, as far as I know, in LLVM intermediate representation, labels are actually scoped to the functions that they're defined in, just like variables. This means that you cannot jump to a label that is outside the scope of your function. You cannot go to another function from the currently executing function. It means that LLVM respects the stack. So if you do try the branch to a uh, label declared in another function, you will see this error. Undefined uh, value percent here. That's because it is defined in another function and it's not in scope here. So just prevent you from doing stupid things like that. <laughs> now, uh, unconditional branch instruction. It is basically just an unconditional go-to. Because there is no conditional expression, it always goes or branches to that level. Being a terminator instruction, it only creates a new node, a new basic block in the control flow graph. And you can use this property to force create a new basic block in the middle of a long series of sequential statements for breaking them up. Suppose you have a large basic block that maybe for clarity you would like to break up into multiple basic blocks. Such as when computing this expression, maybe you want to initialize your variables in one basic block, then compute the first term, compute the second term, and finally compute the equation. So that it looks clearer to the eye, you would just use a branch instruction to go to immediately the next basic block. Okay, so next, uh, about the integer compare instruction, it takes three operands. The first operand is the condition code of the comparison. 
So we can compare operands for equality, uh, for not equal, and then we have several signed and unsigned inequality comparisons. Um, and the remaining two operands are compared, and they must also be identical types. So it returns I1 for two single operands and a vector of I1 for comparing vectors. It, it does element by element comparison. So the integer compare instruction generates a I1 bool value. And this makes sense if you think about it. You only need one bit to store a bool. Why C++ uses 8 bits to store a bool is uh, beyond me. But notice that it doesn't explicitly specify the return data type in the integer compare instruction, probably because that's well defined by the standard that it always returns an I1. It doesn't return any other data type besides that. So, because that is a well-known fact, we do not need to specify the return time explicitly. The only time a return type needs to be specified explicitly from an instruction is when it may change. For example, if an, in a function call, the return type may change based on what function you're calling. The call and move instructions may return different data types depending on their parameters, while integer comparison can return only I1 or a vector of I1. So that is how you remember it. Next, uh, we're going, now that we have the uh, basic concepts in place, we will look at having if statements. So here, we're having a simple uh, if statement. We are having two input parameters and assigning X to the first input parameter A, and if A is greater than B, we add 22x, else we add B to x, and we return the x. So, in LLVM intermediate representation, although this is not completely equivalent to this one, but uh, nonetheless, it has a similar structure, we have an entry basic block that does the integer comparison, and then if uh, the A is greater than B, we go to the if then. If it's not greater, we go to the if else. And in both of these basic blocks, first we have the voiding of the basic block. That's what you want your statement to do. And at the end of the basic block is an unconditional jump to the end of the if statement. Now here, at the end of the basic block, we have the fee instruction, which works also similar to the question mark colon operator in C, C++. It does a conditional assignment or a conditional move, not depending on a Boolean expression, but depending on what was the predecessor of this basic block, what was the path taken during the runtime. So if this if then basic block was the predecessor, it takes the value of add in as the return result. And if you came from this bit of block, it basically grabs the add one. So each conditional path has its own uh, x value, which is add or add one, and only one of these conditional paths is taken, so only one of the, these values is ever used. And the theme merges multiple definitions or copies of a variable along multiple conditional paths into a single definition, depending on which conditional path is taken. Now, um, it's an important point that basically for if statements, there are two ways to get around the SSA property. First is using fee nodes, as we saw here. It is the preferred coding style in LLVM intimate representation. And two, second one is using storage to memory, which is the preferred coding style in C. Now, this code right here yeah, of the LLVM function is the exact same code that we saw here in this example. Just I'm going to explain this in more details. Uh, if we look back at the pseudocode here, uh, we see that x is assigned as a. 
and the old value of a is never changed. So we can avoid creating a new variable x and instead use the old variable a. If a new variable is assigned an old variable and the old variable is never accessed again, then we can think of the new variable as being the same old variable under a new name. So this is the approach taken by the code in the integrated representation using the field node. And that is similar to the paradigm of single static assignment, having multiple copies of the same variable under different names. Another important point is that we are having separate definitions or copies of a variable along each branch. So we have uh, one for add here and then we are having another one for the add one here. The fee select only one of them depending on which control path was taken. So as we can see, the return variable is only determined at the very end. Now here, in order for you to understand this code better, how it works. I have written an implementation of this exact same code just in C. Uh, it's same in behavior and semantics and everything. So, in order to authentically reproduce the intermediate representation code, a separate variable is created to hold the condition as we see here, and it's a const variable. And a question mark colon operator is used to simulate a conditional jump. So this double ampersand, if then, is the address of the label operator in C, which is used to make this happen. So if our condition is true, we are selecting this if then basic block, we go to it, and if the condition is false, we are selecting this basic block and we go to it. Then we have some code and then we always go to the end. So th this is how the LLVM works. So uh, you might just be curious why do we have these semicolons here? So in C programming language, a label can only point to a statement. And a declaration of a variable is actually not considered as a statement. So the work around that would be to insert an empty statement, which is the semicolon directly above the variable uh, declaration in the code after the label. So, uh, however, the representation does not have that limitation because the creation and assignment of a virtual register is a statement, or uh, rather it's an instruction. So, here we're seeing, uh, once again, we have a separate a variable for each path, and I'm having them as const variables to simulate single static assignment. And here the fee instruction is simulated by doing a conditional move based on which control flow path is taken. So, if the then was taken, you get the add, and it was not taken, you get the add one out of here. So, um, uh, but the C programming language has no knowledge about which control flow path was taken, unlike LVM intermediate representation. So, actually, a separate variable is used to record that, and we assign it to true here and false here, but the general concept holds. And now, we co compare the paradigm of constructing uh, an if statement in LLVM versus um, an if statement in C. It uses a quite a different approach. So a separate x variable is actually created in place of the a variable and its value is modified depending on the control flow path taken. The variable itself records its control flow dependent value, hence no fee node is needed here. And we can observe that even in a traditional if statement, the final return value is not known until the very end. So this is actually a, a 
an equivalent implementation of this C code in LLVM intermediate presentation. So, in trying to simulate the C code, a separate percent %x variable is allocated in the stack, and the value of a is stored into it. Uh, because in LLVM intermediate presentation, this is the only way to branch, we are forced to use this thing too. So, in, in both of these uh, branches, we are loading in the x value, then adding some number into it, and then we are storing it, the result back into percent %x. So here, add and add one variables are needed not for having multiple copies of a variable, one for each control path, but they are simply for assigning intermediate values of computations before they are stored into percent %x. Uh, it, that's just for doing the arithmetic, because we cannot do arithmetic directly on uh, memory variables. But uh, as we see here, the percent %x, uh, it, it remembers its value. So, no fee instruction is necessary since uh, the value was stored into the memory location of the variable percent %x itself in each branch that was taken. Uh, and because the uh, percent %x remembers uh, it, it, its value, the field structure is only necessary when we need to merge multiple potential copies of a variable into a single timeline. So that is not needed here. Now, uh, we're going to compare both of these two uh, paradigms and see uh, uh, these two coding styles and see which one may be more efficient. Uh, so, first we're going to look at the storage, using storage to memory version, since it is fresh in our mind. Uh, yeah, so we're allocating a separate uh, X variable, and based on, an, in each of these conditions, we ca calculate separate va values, and we store each of those values into the percent %x. So, in the end, uh, we, don't have, we don't really care which uh, control flow path it took. Um, it, it would have stored the necessary variable into the X, so we just load, load it in and return whatever the value was. Whereas for using three nodes, uh, we, we don't have uh, a separate variable, we just uh, have a condition uh, with these two intermediate variables, and then in the fee uh, node, if we uh, if we came from the if then, we grab the, this value. If we came from the else, we grab this value. So it knows that and it is able to return. So this results in a, a shorter and somewhat cleaner looking code. And initially, we avoid taking up a single memory allocation. And uh, we, av we avoid loading and storing values into the random access memory, which uh, takes time. Uh, so, doing everything in virtual register is more efficient. Now, having that knowledge, let's see if we can uh, simplify a function. So we are implementing a max function that returns the maximum value based on two, um, two input parameters. So in the first version of the function, we are having uh, a variable here. We're allocating a separate variable. If A is greater than B, we branch to uh, true and we store the value of a into that variable. And if it's false, we store the value of b into that variable. Then, when we get to the end, we load that the value back out of the variable, and we return whatever that variable is. So, uh, the important point here is that a redundant extra variable allocated on the stack. Can we get rid of that? Yes, we can. Here, we are having a phenode instead. 
So we are doing the comparison. Then we we branch to this uh, basic block if the condition is true. If the condition is false, we go here and then we go to the end. So the main point is here. If the condition was true, if the condition was true, then we select A to be returned. The, uh, if the condition was false, if we went through this false basic block, then we select the B value to be returned. So we do not even need temporary virtual registers inside both of these branching basic blocks. That is a main observation. Because no branch dependent computations are performed in them, we are only using the fee to keep track of how the history of how we branch. So we're only using it to keep track of uh, what was the condition, was A greater than B. And it turns out that this can actually be optimized even further just knowing that one single observation. And behold, this is the final optimized result. It is just a single basic block. Uh, so this is uh, equivalent in C code. We are using a question mark colon operator to select a value to be returned based on the condition. This is what select instruction does. If A was greater, we uh, select A to be returned. If it was uh, not, then we select the B. So there is no conditional branching. Uh, there is a conditional move instead, greatly simplifying the code. So we do not uh, need to deal with such inefficiencies as branch prediction, for example. And we, we have no jumping around. We just execute the instructions uh, sequentially. So that's a cool uh, little optimization that you can do if you recognize the, the various patterns that are built in. And now, uh, some notes about compiling if statements into the few instructions. Um, uh, so, uh, what, when we're compiling them into the actual assembly code, what happens to the few instruction? Um, uh, if we just run the LLVM compiler without optimization, the compiler replaces the few instruction with a stack memory axis, as in the first example. So, you get no benefit to using that. However, if you turn on the first level of optimization, the compiler actually converts the fee instruction into a conditional move into our register. So the fee instruction can be used for, but it is only converted into efficient assembly code by the compiler if optimization is enabled. Uh, off the top of my head, I actually don't know if the compiler enables using the select statement in the generated code. A converting a conditional branch into a conditional move. That I actually don't know. But anyway, now that we have seen how to implement uh, if statements, let's see how we can implement loops. Uh, the first example is a for loop using Alaka, which is the less efficient one. Uh, so here we are having the initialization block. We are allocating a variable to hold the counter and storing zero into it. Then we go into the condition. And uh, in, the, in the for condition, we, we basically load the value that was in the counter. Um, and we compare that value to the number of iterations. Is it less than the number of iterations? If it is true, we go to the body of the loop. If it's false, then we break the loop and go to the end. So what's in the body of the loop? Well, we first uh, print uh, the value of the counter. Uh, then we, uh, after printing whatever the value of the counter, we have the update expression in the for loop. So we execute that. We load the old value of the counter. We add one to it which gets new value of the counter, and we store the new value of the counter back into this um, allocated variable. And then we jump to the for condition, and now our counter has the updated incremented version. So we once again load, load in the new version this time, and we compare 
is it true? If it's true, we if it's less than the number of iterations, we do for one more a loop. And if it's not, then we end. So some important things uh, to note is that uh, uh, this counter is actually an eight-bit integer because uh, I will only pass in small values as the number of iterations uh, in this demo and int 8 underscore t is the smallest bit with integer data type in C++. Uh, you can have less of a bit with, but I just wanted to be consistent here. And uh, yeah, we indeed could uh, rearrange the statements in the body of the for loop and use the old counter uh, value instead of the i for printing. That way we get rid of an extra load. But I wanted to keep them separate to illustrate the point of the updated expression, which is equivalent to uh, counter plus plus in your for loop. Uh, so even if you had something different in the uh, for loop body, uh, this update expression would always remain the same. Uh, so, uh, and because a while loop is the same as the for loop, uh, just without the explicit uh, uh, for init basic block, um, I decided not to include a separate example for the while loop. Uh, so, we assume that all condition variables have already been initialized in the previous basic block in a while loop. So, that's that. Uh, next example is do while loop uh, here. Um, this is the entry basic block, the entrance to the function. Similarly, we are allocating our counter variable with the initial value of zero, and we go into the loop body. We load the uh, counter in. Uh, we print the value of the counter, and we increment to get the new value of the counter, then we store the new value of the counter back in. So that is our uh, increment at the end of our do loop body, and then we uh, branch to the do condition. Now, since the new counter value was just stored into the percent counter, and since the value of the counter has not changed since then, we can avoid loading the value back from memory again. So just compare uh, the new counter value to the number of iterations. And uh, it's assigned comparison uh, because we, we might compare a positive value. Uh, if we compare a positive value to a negative value, uh, that would stop the loop instead of um, if we do unsigned list and that would treat any negative value as a large positive number. So we would have an infinite loop. So it's important to just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and then uh, once we've compared that condition, if it's true, we go back and execute the body of the loop again. If it's false, we go to the end. So uh, in the do while loop, I actually use the percent %i uh, more flexibly, since the update is part of the do body, and there's no special update expression that should be kept separate, as in the for loop. And another thing uh, worth mentioning uh, might not be apparent, but the do while loop always executes at least once. There is no condition prior to entering the, the do loop body. Uh, this is because the do condition actually comes after the do body. Even if the condition is initially false to begin with, it would still execute the first iteration of the loop. Now, if the condition had been at the start, as in a for loop or while loop, it would keep false values from running in the loop. And here, even if the condition is false to begin with, we still do a single iteration. So, there are only two kinds of loops that you can create. Now, we return back to the for loop example, but we want to eliminate that memory allocation, so we use a fee instruction instead. We have our initialization, uh, and we have an initial value here, but we're not allocating a, a, a new value, so this is just our register value. Now, important thing to note here is that our counter value in the condition is actually uh, controlled by fee instruction. If we come out of the initialization block, as we are, 
we grab the uh, initialization value of the counter, which is just a zero. And if we come out to the body of, of the for loop, we grab whatever is the new updated version of the counter is. So we do the comparison, uh, and uh, since uh, our counter value is zero, it's less than the number of iterations, we go into the loop body, we print the value of the counter, and for print we can use uh, just the counter value uh, because uh, it is not a pointer, it's a, a virtual register value, so we don't need to do the load. And now in the update expression we just add one to it uh, to get the new counter value, and we go back up to the condition. Now, since we came from the four body, we grab the new counter value, and the new counter value was 0 plus 1, which is 1. So 1 is assigned to the counter value here. And then we compare, and uh, if it's true, we do another iteration, and if it's false, we just break the loop. So you might be thinking, yeah, we assigned counter value once when we entered, and then we did the loop, and then we reassigned it again to the new counter value. So doesn't this uh, break the SSA property? Actually, it does not, because single static assignment property only applies if you scan your eyes line by line through the source code. It does not apply when you execute the code uh, though, it only applies uh, spatially, not temporally, um, as relating to the behavior of the program. So, in other words, you can think that uh, this property applies only for a single iteration of the loop. Single static assignment property does not take into account multiple iterations of the loop, that there are actually multiple copies of counter value, one for each iteration. Uh, uh, this is the, because the algorithm that determines if static single assignment property uh, code holds, uh, it, it just considers it spatially. It just scans the code line by line. It does not simulate or run the code because it has not been compiled or assembled yet. Uh, so, and if you uh, look to the code, you indeed see that counter value is assigned here only and nowhere else. Similarly, new counter value is only assigned here. Now, for the do body, uh, for the do loop and the entry beta box, since we don't have the memory allocation, we can just jump in straight into the body of the loop. And our counter value, which is called i now, uh, it, uh, if it comes from the entry bit block, it is assigned to zero. And if it comes from the new condition, it assigns a new counter value. So, in the body, we print uh, the value of the counter and we increment the counter by assigning it to a new counter value. And then we go into the new condition. Now, since the new counter value represents the new i value, we can just compare it to the number of iterations. So if it's still less than the number of iterations, we go for another loop. So now we came from the condition, so we assign the new counter value, which is now one. Print the one and then uh, update and do for another condition. And if it's false, we break the loop. So. Don't let the fact that there being multiple i's here, multiple i variables, one for each iteration doubt you. Don't let it doubt you. Single static assignment property is in fact never broken since there is only one assignment to the percent i. It's just on this line. So now we move on to switch statements in LLVM intermediate representation. Uh, so to use a switch statement uh, in the intermediate representation, you just uh, use a jump table. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 
A jump table is just an array where each element in the array, you see row 1, 2, 3, it uh, actually contains the address of the instruction to jump to in that case. Um, so, uh, if, uh, for example, your passing value number is 1, uh, it would actually index that array with the number 1 and uh, because uh, the value application 1 is case 1, it just jumps to that uh, case without evaluating every single one that have been prior to that. And because of this, the time taken to the perform the switch is independent of the number of cases. It doesn't check every single one, so it's constant time. So, uh, if, however, the switch value is not one of these uh, indices to the jump table, it goes to the default label, jumps to the default, uh, and returns whatever your default value is. And uh, you can name these labels to be whatever you want. Uh, they don't have to be named like that. They just named case dot zero, case dot one, and default for clarity. But you can name it Bob, for example. Oh, uh, so uh, and uh, so in, in order to uh, understand uh, more uh, what exactly uh, is a jump table, I created a C equivalent version of the uh, LLVM intermediate representation switch statement code. Here, the jump table has to be explicitly defined instead of being embedded in the switch. And as you see, it is just an array of labels. And this uh, double ampersand is the address of a label operator in C. And we use a uh, computer go to to manually get the address of the label and dereference it. So as you see, uh, if the number is greater than the uh, size of the jump table, you go to the default case and jump to it. However, in the else statement um, expression of the, the operator, it is actually indexing that, that array, indexing that jump table with the value of the integer num. num. And it, in constant time, gets uh, the, the value out. And then, uh, because the array stores a pointer to a label, we need to dereference it to get the actual label out to go to that label. Yeah, so uh, so this uh, default case, underscore case right here, the name, is used as the name of the label because default key, it's actually already a special keyword in C, so that's the reason for these naming conventions. Now that we know how to create simple control flow statements in LLV, intermediate representation, we can see how we can call functions too. Uh, so for calling fu for functions defined in the same transmission unit, no specific action is required. But for functions defined in another translation unit, in order for your code to compile, it has to have the exact declaration of that function. Both the declaration and the call to that function need to have the same signature and return time as the definition of that function for the program to compile and link successfully. It's the same in C, it's the same in LVM intermediate representation. Uh, so this is the syntax for it. Um, in C, I put the X term here. It means that a variable or a function is defined in another source code file. Since function declarations are external by default, it is not necessary to put the keyword there. However, I put it there explicitly, but the compiler doesn't need it. It reminds the reader that the function declaration is external, that the function is defined in another file. And since humans are more fallible than computers, I find that their reminder helps. So for, for calling the function, also the syntax is similar in LLVM implemented representation as in C, but 
we remember that we have to explicitly put both the return data type of the function and the data type of the parameter. Those are the uh, two main change here. Now, suppose we have a function in C code that we want to call from the LLVM intermediate representation code. So, uh, so we basically want to uh, call this say hello function. So first we need to provide the declaration with the same signature and the same name of the function. And then uh, after that, uh, we need to compile and link these two source code files together. So the first line assembles the LLVM code into a bit code file. And the second line generates the bit code file for this C code file. Now we have two bit code files, one for each translation unit. And we want to link both these files into the final uh, program uh, .bitcode. And then we can execute it using the LVM interpreter. So what happens? We uh, assign 7 to this number, we pass it into the function, and it says hello. The special number is 7. If everything works, and that is good, and we Uh, anyway, now we want to do something similar, but now our main function is in C and we want to call custom function written in LVM intermediate representation from the C code. So, uh, just as previously, the uh, function declaration and the definition must match, and also the call uh, to the function has to be the same. So we're passing in 12 to this function. 12 comes in, we add in 5. That returns 17 for us. And it prints result equals 17 in the main function. So some observations here. Um, uh, so basically, uh, LVM intermediate representation specifies a fixed bit width for the integer data types. So uh, in, in C, that would be the standard integer data types, as we used in the previous example. We include the standard integer data types and use int32 underscore t. However, what you might not know, if you're a beginner, is that uh, bit widths of regular C integer data types like int and long are not explicitly specified by the standard and they are machine dependent. So, you might have a 16-bit width for all that matter. Uh, uh, so, th that's a reason why you should use the standard integer data types. However, you don't have to use them uh, if you don't want to. So, if you know that an int is 32 bits on your machine, you can just use that. Uh, but if you do want your code to be fully portable, then uh, you would have to use the standard integer data types as in the previous example. Uh, now, uh, so suppose we want to uh, call a C standard library function from the LLVM intermediate representation source code. So in order to do that, you have to fill the compiler to link in that function. Now, there are two ways to tell the compiler to link in a standard library function. The first is you hashtag include the header file, uh, what that does is it provides a list of um, uh, declarations for you. Or if you don't want to do that, you just write the declaration in the source code file by yourself. Now, this applies to both C and LLVM intermediate representation as well. And you can use this method to call both C standard library functions and OS system functions as well. But uh, you can't directly include the uh, the header files into your LLVM intermediate representation code because these header files, they have C syntax. So it would be a syntax error to include them. So we need to uh, 
write the declaration manually. And if we want to uh, uh, use uh, one of the standard library functions, we would just pull up the man page. Uh, so the man pages, they have uh, descriptions of every single function in the C standard library. So we just look at what is the signature and we copy it here in the declaration, which allows us to use a good char function to print characters to the screen. So here we specify the ASCII value of the character in order to print it to the screen. Now you might be noticing though that is a function parameter is implicitly named percent zero here because an explicit name is given, so it's different from the C here, but that doesn't matter because the compiler doesn't care about what is the name of a function argument. Yeah. Because the name is not part of the signature. Because uh, if you think about C++, you can't overload based on different names of parameters. They are still the same function. So the name of a parameter is not uh, part of the signature. So uh, if you're a beginner, whenever you have down to that, just remember a uh, function overloading. Uh, yeah, so uh, in order to link in the C standard library function, it's simple. You just assemble the LLVM source code file into a bit code file. That automatically links it in for you. Then you run the bit code file through the LLVM interpreter, prints the A, pull chart, and then it gives you back your so, uh, something worth mentioning for beginners about function declarations, uh, if you don't know about them, it's just function declarations, they actually do not make it into the assembly code. A function declaration is not a CPU instruction. It is just information for the compiler to help the compiler help us for catching errors with the signature of the function declaration and the function call not matching, the compiler will generate an error for you. It is information for the compiler so that the compiler can find and link in functions to find in other files. Uh, function de declaration does not make the program bigger. It's just information for the compiler to help us use this correctly. For example, uh, the error file hashtag include iostream is about 39,750 lines. Does your program get bigger because you include it? No. It does not increase the size of your executable if you do not use any of the functions defined within. The compiler is smart about it, and it only links in the actual functions that you do use uh, in your actual source code into the final executable. So a header file just includes the declarations of, of the functions. Uh, it doesn't have the definitions in it, so uh, it doesn't contribute to the overall size of your executable. So uh, uh, next, uh, so that was an example uh, calling a C standard library functions. Now, what if we want to be calling um, operating system functions from LLVM intermediate? It is a uh, Here, uh, we want to call uh, fork and we want to call C, which are OS specific functions. So, uh, we would need to provide the, uh, the declarations of the functions. We need to open up the map page for each of these functions. So, uh, we know that size of uh, PID it is 32 bit integer, and we also know that uh, size of unsigned int is also, it's a 32-bit integer. And uh, we know that LLVM IR uh, doesn't care about the signedness of data type, so we can put I32 in here. Uh, so, um, I, uh, so instead of putting the declarations in the LLVM file, can we put them in the header file? It turns out that LLVM intermediate representation lacks support for header files by default. So uh, we can actually use the C preprocessor to do text replacements, uh, to do text replacements for us, because the preprocessor doesn't care about the syntax. It's just a copy-paste operation. 
Unfortunately, the C++ preprocessor only accepts uh, C source code files as input. So I need a script to remedy that. Uh, so uh, basically, this first line of, the, of this shell script copies the LVM file into a temporary C file, then it preprocesses that C file, it assembles the preprocessed uh, LVM file, so uh, in the preprocessor it just puts these and includes them in here, then it assembles the preprocessed LVM file and then it deletes the temporary files. That gives us a bit code file. Yes, it's a trick, uh, and it's a uh, maybe non-standard trick, but yeah, I, I like it. I, I think it's very clever. So uh, here, once again, uh, running this, uh, uh, we run it, run this multiprocess.llo file to the preprocessor script that generates us a bit code file, and we'll run it through LLM interpreter to execute it. Uh, we call for uh, so um, if, if it's the parent process, uh, the parent process, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the parent uh, process sleeps for five seconds, so it's sleeping now. Uh, then the, uh, the fork forks off a child process, and uh, if the condition is, is false, it's a child process. So it puts uh, the C character in. And in five more uh, seconds have passed, the parent process uh, prints and it gives you back uh, your command prompt. And if you were to put the sleep instead of in the parent process, if you were to put it into the child process, the parent process would finish first, it would return, then you would get your command prompt back. Then in five seconds, the child process would wake up, put the C directly into the command prompt and it would return. And if you hit enter, it would say uh, no such command C. So uh, this is an example of uh, using both your own custom header files uh, in all the intermediate representation, which is a technique that I invented, and also calling operating system specific functions from LLVM intermediate representation. This is the last slide of my presentation, so this is my conclusion. Thank you everyone for attending.